protected or privileged in that discourse are some of the following. Many of the procedural capacities that we need to undertake our tasks simply are not captured um, in that discourse. For instance, much of the embodied um, learning that we, we use to <coughs> conduct our work that occurs through sensory processes. So, for instance, the midwife here who is listening to the baby's heart using the Doppler scope, she's listening to, to the birthing mother's tummy and she's hearing a sound. <laughs> I hope it's not that public. And she will make a decision upon the health of the fetus's heart by hearing the sound. And then she'll walk over to a table on a piece of paper and write something on it. But she's already made the decision by that time. It's the sound that she's heard. Welders, for instance. Welders. Welders can't actually see what they're doing. And what they often um, rely upon is the sound of the weld actually occurring. And they use the sound to um, determine whether the, the flow of the weld is being continuous or not. And then there's haptic qualities. On the image here you can see a physiotherapist who feels the body to um, determine the points of pressures and all those things that physiotherapists do. We're reminded that the planes you flew here in probably all had haptic technology in and that is that when they removed the direct control between the um, uh, aerolons and the joystick, and this gave pilots a lack of ability to actually feel for the plane. And so these, as I understand it, most contemporary planes have haptic technology, which brings a sense of feel back into the controls of the plane. Years ago I used to work in the clothing industry, and one thing I would always do in the manufacturing situation is feel fabric. And I would feel fabric in particular for one reason that I would want to feel it and let it go to see how much fill was in the fabric. Because that would help me know how the fabric would go through manufacturing. And if there were problems in manufacturing, I would use feel a lot. And you, I'd also use feel for other things such as the feel of a fabric for cutting patterns from and stuff like that. So um, these are important um, skills, uh, capacities, as is dispositions. Um, that is the qualities that we, we would hope a, perhaps a, a midwife would have, or the commitment that a young woman who's volunteering for Singapore Armed Forces um, and has just completed her basic training um, is expressing um, in her occupation or vocation. And these capacities are central to much of occupational performance, yet they're very rarely captured in the kinds of educational frameworks we engage in and the kinds of industry national standards that are used, etc., etc. And part of that is, oh, because they're, um, they're not measurable. Um, now, importantly, this is not an anti-educational um, uh, polemic. What I'm trying to do is make space for a consideration of learning through practice, and I've just been advised here about a quarter now to do it in. Um, I think there's three key elements to the um, an account of learning through practice. First, as I've said, curriculum practices, pedagogic practices, and curriculum is a set of activities. And pedagogic practices are the means by which experiences can be enriched. And then the importance of um, personal epistemological practice, how people engage and learn and make sense. Um, there are, I guess, in terms of practice curriculum, there is two broad dimensions. One is the, simply the immersion of, um, uh, in an occupation, and then secondly, the restructuring of experiences. In earlier times when you learned in family, the first one was the one which likely predominates. I could give examples, but it, it seems I don't have time. But it's more likely in contemporary times that there's deliberate structuring of experiences and the ordering of experiences. And anybody who's read Jean Lay's work knows about the, the learning curriculum and the progression from activities which have low um, error consequences through to those tasks that have high error consequences. Um, so, um, I haven't got time for examples, that's depressing. But I'll just use one very briefly. This is a small <coughs> pub in um, the city of Singapore called Marina Pub. 1,300 rooms. Um, the young people in Singapore don't want to be room attendants. So they have to bring folk in from Vietnam, Philippines, mainland China, and train them. And just to give an example of the of a practice curriculum, 
What they do in this hotel is that the, um, the room attendants are, are, are prepared in what is referred to as a checked out room. That is a room where there's no guests in it, they bomb. So they can learn how to make those pillows, you know, get the pillows in very tight, make the room very nice and tidy, etc., etc. And then only when, once they've got to a certain level of performance, they're then moved into look after rooms which are checked in rooms where they might encounter a, um, might encounter a client. And part of that issue is um, that they might not have very good English skills. So, um, an example of a deliberate structuring experience is, is with midwifery training. And mid 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 midwives engage in two kinds, midwifery students, sorry, engage in two kinds of practical experiences. One is which is called the follow-throughs, where they engage with birthing women through the entire prenatal process and the immediate postnatal process, and then also engage in clinical experiences. And what's suggested in this diagram here is that the, the, the first structuring of experiences should be with the follow-throughs, because that's how they learn about, about what birthing's like from the birthing mother's perspective. They learn the goals, requirements, they learn the sensitivities, they learn the issues associated with that. And that would seem to be a far more important set of skills before they begin to participate in um, clinical placements. So that's an example of a, a curriculum. Now, in terms of practice pedagogies, there's a list of these which come from the anthropological literature, and these are kind of pedagogic practice which be conducted through work, and they each have particular kinds of contributions. Again, I've had more time. Um, but not hardly about time. So, um, I'll give one more example. And this is a rich pedagogic activity, it's a very common one, which is used in work in hospitals, and it's called the nurses' handovers. And what happens at nurses' handovers is the incoming shift of nurses are, are briefed by the outgoing shift of nurses. And they normally discuss five things. Firstly, the patient, who the patient is, how old they are, um, whether there's anybody at home to care for them, should they be discharged, the condition or conditions of the patient, and the kind of treatment or treatments they're having, and then they talk about the risk, how the patients are responding to that, and then they make a prognosis, a judgment of where the patient will be at the end of the shift next week or whatever. And so as I'm sure you can appreciate, this is a very rich learning experience. It's also a learning experience that learners at different levels of confidence can engage in. I've sat in these meetings and, um, and, um, and can understand some of the concepts and a more experienced student or a graduate nurse could engage in a very different way in the, in the, in the making of prognosis, etc. Um, there's also this stuff that I've done earlier about how to promote these forms of knowledge in the workplace. And um, there's personal epistemologies as I've said, them, these are important bases by how people come to know, and they're more than beliefs, they're how we experience things, as I've said, through haptic sensory processes as well as observation. And, and this is central to how we make sense of, uh, of what we engage with and know it work. And the central to these are things such as I've referred to imitation or mimetic learning, a process of, called ontogenetic ritualization, where you learn how to engage with others and what is appropriate and not. The active engagement in learning. And it's worthwhile noting here, and I do wish I had more time, that the origins of the word apprenticeship appear to come from the word apprehend. That is, it's the apprentice's job to take the knowledge, not be taught the knowledge. And as I've already foreshadowed, that in Japan, the word for apprentice is miniari, one who learns by observation. And then there's this other term called miniari kukuyu, which is an obtrusive process of observation. And the importance of learner readiness and effortful engagement, including a critical one. So what? I guess workplaces are legitimate sites for initial and ongoing learning of occupational practice. Um, like educational settings, they make particular contributions that need to be utilised and augmented. And they, um, they, they have particular kinds of um, conceptions of curriculum and pedagogic practices um, are important, as indeed are the kind of personal practices that people use when engaging in learning.
And it's also important one to identify how this how these kind of strategies I've referred to, the approaches I've referred to, will be appropriate for particular kinds of learning, for particular occupations and for particular workplaces. And very importantly, we need to position um, learners as being interdependent, not independent, interdependent, to engage with others, artifacts, text, etc., to, to engage in that way. And then finally, um, an invitation. <coughs> what I've got here is something called cotton. Um, you all know this stuff, and it came. It comes from something called a cotton bowl. <laughs> cotton, as you know, came from somewhere right over there in Central Asia. When it first came to Europe, it came with the intelligence that this was a vegetable fiber. It was not from an animal. So people in Europe began to think, well, what, what kind of plant is this? <laughs> this is called the vegetable land of Tartary. And this is what people with their existing knowledge of where fibre like that came from imagined this plant would look like. Now the point I'm trying to make here is that because we all grow up and have experiences and are part, very much part of the school society, we might minimise the importance of learning arising outside of education institutions. Our discourses, the way we think about it, the way we engage it, may be far poorer for it. So my invitation is for you to think differently, a little bit, about um, how people learn through work and not simply apply the educational discourse and the discourse of school societies in understanding that kind of learning. Thank you very much for your attendance. Well, thank you very much, Stephen. Sorry for rushing you through uh, part of it. it uh, I wanted to open the floor for one or two questions. Uh, but keep in mind that there is a question session with uh, Stephen at lunch um, in the um, hotel um, restaurant. So, are there one or two burning questions? Okay. I'm uh, interested in how you look at assessment in workplace learning. It's a school thing, assessment, but yeah. how do they do it in workplaces? It's, it's a really, well, I mean, can I start something quite different? Isn't it interesting the way that when you go to a school, the first thing you do is you get told what you've got to learn. And increasingly, as that's been highly regulated, you're told this is what you'll learn. Aims, goals, and objectives. And what's really interesting about the tradition of learning through work is it is the learner's job to actually work out what needs to be learned. So it's almost invert, in, inverted. So the first point is that, in some sense, you could argue we've actually generated a sort of a natural association between uh, assessment and and learning by predefining what people will learn, and increasingly in vocational education and professional education, that defining of pre-specified learning outcomes is done a long, long way and very remotely from the places where performance occurs. And my view is there's no such thing as an occupational expert that you're an expert in terms of where you actually practice. Um, because, you know, for instance, being a, an expert nurse is one thing in a major city hospital, it's quite another in a small rural community, for instance. So in terms of assessment, I think it's helpful to actually privilege the workplace in terms of the knowledge that needs to be learned. And I would do that through a two-tier system, and that is, um, a, First of all, whatever the, the occupation is, there will always be the canonical knowledge of the occupation, the kind of knowledge that a nurse, a doctor, a hairdresser needs to know, but also some uh, 
acceptance that how that knowledge and practice is manifested in a particular situation is important to assess because that's how the person engages and look at the relationships between the two. In terms of the actual processes of assessment, I think it's a question of processes, of following a person over time and taking different measures of, um, of how they perform. The most, one of the most first things that we need to assess people in the workplace is for safe working. And I would defy anybody to um, assess a person on safe working using, for instance, behavioural objectives and behavioural measures, which is the common practice in vocational education. But rather something like safe working needs to be um, assessed over a period of time, um, not as a single incident when somebody's being observed by somebody in the checklist, for instance. So for me, there's, we, you know, the, the, perhaps there's the thought of um, inverting some of this stuff and thinking differently um, about assessment not necessarily being pre-specified learning outcomes, but the end of a journey for the learner. And then there's the processes by which that might happen. Okay. Any other questions you may ask uh, Stephen during lunch? Thank you very much for uh, your attention and uh, Stephen, thank you very much for this wonderful <laughs> Thank you.